Good morning. Good morning. So it's like about 9.30 a.m. here. So it's like 3.30 a.m. back where I'm from in Jersey, as Alex said. Um, Alex now lives where my hometown is of Brooklyn. So it's all the same area. And it's 3.30 a.m., so this is like the party hour. So um, thank you so much for having me. Um, so uh, really excited to be here at Full Stack Fest. This is my first time in Barcelona. Uh, and it's been really beautiful so far, even despite the jet lag. Um, when they asked me to keynote, and the funny thing about keynoting is that you don't really tell anybody what you're talking about, so none of you have any idea what I'm going to talk about. Um, but I want to speak to the theme of the conference. Um, so the motto is, problems of today, wonders from the future. Uh, and the speaker handbook they gave us was, the goal is we want to inspire people to try new things, which is pretty cool. But like, trying new things sounds like obvious. Like, shouldn't we all want to try new things? Why should we have to be inspired? Um, and that's because there are a lot of problems of today um, that combat us from being inspired to try new things. And so thinking about that, um, the, the motto, like, trying new things would be the wonders of the future, uh, and the problems of today would be the barriers that are blocking us from trying those new things. Uh, and some may interpret problems of today as like how to build a performant single-page client-side JavaScript web app, which is a problem of today, but that is sort of intertwined with more of the social issues um, in the tech industry today. Um, and they're all sort of things that can lead to technical problems. And many of us prefer to focus on things like performance, um, but then we ignore things like accessibility that plays in line. Um, so these are the problems of today, um, and they don't make for a nice t-shirt, um, even in cuter colors. Uh, so how do we solve these problems so that we can actually try new things, all of us uh, in the industry and who want to be into it? Um, I don't know. Talk over. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think, so like I can't solve all of these issues, and neither can you individually, but I think all to together we can work on it, and I think the first part is um, bringing awareness to it and admitting that these social problems exist. And we're all engineers, or most of us are engineers, or people who are interested in using code to solve problems. And so the first part of a problem is specking it out, finding the requirements, designing a plan, and then implementing it, and then testing, maintaining, scaling, and so forth. And we can apply software engineering principles to social issues, as we should. Um, and so we bring awareness to things by talking about it, or if you're from Brooklyn like me, talking about it. Uh, and we can be more aware of everyone when we're designing and building software, uh, both for fun and for work. So what I want to talk, today, uh, talk to you today about are two products. Um, that I work on and how I think of these issues as we're working on them. Um, and it's both like a product that people, they're both products people can use, but one is my passion project, my hobby, and the other one is my job. And I think that a lot of us who here has like passion projects or side projects, okay. And who here is working on a product that more than five people are using? Probably, yeah. So we all sort of fall into that envelope where we're building different kinds of things with different kinds of users. Are we thinking about all of those users when we're building them, even if it's not something we're being paid to do, like a side project? So my uh, name is Jen Schiffer. Uh, as Alex had said, I come from New Jersey. I live in Jersey City. It's a small North Jersey town across the river from Manhattan. So it's like really, really close. Some people jet ski from Jersey City to Manhattan, which I think is weird, because the river's kind of gross, so I won't do it, um, but it's very close. Uh, if you're here tomorrow, Steve Kinney, the first speaker, he too uh, is originally from New Jersey, so this is the Jersey takeover of Barcelona. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> I run a meetup called Jersey Script, where we casually meet at a bar arcade on the last Tuesday of every month, so if you're ever in the New York City area and there, you're there during the last Tuesday of every month, please uh, hit me up on Twitter. We would love to have you come and chat. We don't do talks, we just hang out and socialize, and it's really fun. 
Uh, and I also co MC Brooklyn JS, where we do have talks. We're on the third Thursday of every month. So again, if you're ever in New York at that time, let us know. We would love to have you. Uh, so this is uh, me about 15 years ago. Um, well, no, it's a little later than 15 years ago. This is maybe about like eight years ago. This is me at my first tech conference ever. Um, I was having a blast. There's a chocolate fountain. Uh, one of the speakers told me at the speaker dinner yesterday that they were at a, there's like a fancy wedding they're going to and there's a chocolate fountain except the chocolate is gilded, it's gold. And I was like, whoa, there's a chocolate fountain in my talk, but it's not gold. Um, and I didn't have time to Photoshop it to gold, so next time. Um, but before I entered tech, I worked in academia. Um, I went to college about 15 years ago. I got two degrees, my bachelor's and master's in computer science. Uh, and then I became a department administrator in that computer science department where I did curriculum planning, I did recruiting, um, all sorts of fun bureaucratic stuff. Um, and I got bored and kind of tired of the sexism in, the, in that area. And so when you get bored and tired of the bullshit that's going on and you want to try new things, you think of a way to move on. And so I did. I became a web developer uh, at the NBA, the National Basketball Association, um, in about 2012. Uh, this is my former coworker, Luke. He's really young and he's like a genius with, st with statistics. Uh, and so I always like to leer over and watch him doing magical stuff with spreadsheets and, and uh, helped him learn R so that he can program more stuff, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, and it's at the NBA where with my good friend Nick, we started uh, CSS Perverts, which is a, uh, a satirical blog about tech culture, specifically web development, which nobody was really doing at the time. Um, it's kind of, if you've ever read The Onion or any satirical things, it's like that, but worse. Uh, <laughs> and so I was bored and frustrated at my job at the MBA, and when I get bored, I go to try new things, and so I tried writing. Um, I left the MBA to go into consulting for a few years at this small company called Boku. Uh, and then after three years, I got bored of that and I wanted to try new things. And that's where I ended up where I'm at today, which is at Fog Creek. Um, so Fog Creek is a company headquartered in New York City. It's about 17 years old. Um, we've been making content and software to help developers do their best jobs with the best tools for a long time. Um, I use this diagraph to explain Fog Creek because you probably use some of their products. Um, we co-created Stack Overflow. Who here is you Stack Overflow? <laughs> Anybody who codes, right? Uh, and we, we created Trello, which is now owned by Atlassian. Uh, nice people. Uh, we have Fog Bugs, which is like the first bug tracking software ever. Uh, and it all started from the co-founder of the company, Joel Spolsky's blog, Joel on Software, who here reads blogs. <laughs> so what we're currently working on right now is a product called Glitch that's at the end of this diagraph here. Um, and Glitch, we call it the friendly community where you'll build the app of your dreams. But, um, and, and this, is, this is our team, I love this photo. We had our offsite in Cabo a couple of weeks ago, and this is my coworker Will photo bombing the Glitch team. That's us there, it's me in the center. Uh, <laughs> And the team is really great. We've been working on Glitch for a while. Um, we launched under the name Glitch back in February. I've been there for about seven months. Um, but by the time we had launched, I had already built the app of my dreams before Glitch even was like an idea. Um, and about eight years ago, that was make8bitart.com. Um, I was bored when I was in academia and I wanted to become a web developer, but I didn't know JavaScript. I was writing Java. I was writing. Uh, galaxy collision simulators in Java and uh, rubric generators and forms in PHP and I wanted to build cool fun stuff on the web and learn at the same time and because new future ideas to me back then were JavaScript and the HTML5 Canvas API, um, I decided to learn JavaScript uh, and fulfill my other you know, future cool idea which was quitting academia um, to be in the tech industry. Um, and so, yeah, the app of my dreams is an in-browser pixel editor where I can make art for free, uh, portably, and I can learn how to build web apps so that I can one day get paid to both make art and build web applications. And spoiler alert, that's what I do today. Uh, 
Because at the end of the day, I want, like, if you ask me, and my CEO, Anil, has asked me, like, what do you want to do when you grow up, and I, what do you want to be when you grow up, and I'm like, oh, I just want to, like, be happy and hang out with my friends. Like, that's, who else wants to just be happy and hang out with their friends for the rest of their life? Wouldn't that be a dream? Uh, so I spent a lot of my time trying to work on products and teach people and talk to people and learn from people so that the opportunities I have today that allow me to be happy and, and hang out with my friends and do cool stuff. I want those opportunities to be open to everybody. Um, but they're not because of these barriers to entry, like I had mentioned before. Um, and it's very hard to get into the industry today. Uh, well, it's not hard to get in. It's, it's easy to find tools to learn, but there's a sort of gap between the beginner just learning to code and the expert who knows how to build a web application. There's sort of a, a lack of stuff in between, both in terms of like learning materials and also just mentorship and like guidance from one end of the bridge to the other. And those are the problems of today that uh, are blocking us from using those wonders of the future um, to build cool stuff. Now, I didn't enter the industry until about five years ago. This is the day um, of my interview at the MBA, and they immediately made an offer, and I was at a bus stop waiting for my bus, and it, I was really excited, so I took a selfie. Uh, <laughs> and so I didn't enter the industry until I was 27, about five years ago. That's pretty late to enter tech uh, these days. Uh, and being a white woman in America, I have a lot of privilege in order to enter and stay in the industry, but still, it was very hard for me um, and so my barriers are a lot lower than others, but they still exist. So I want to talk a little bit about like, why it takes so long for some people to be able to get into the industry, let alone stay in it. So my main barriers to entry were money. Um, learning is very expensive. Um, I ended up using what little of my savings I had because I was broke. I was a graduate student. They don't really pay graduate students all that much. Uh, I just spent whatever I left in my savings to go to Boku for a JavaScript workshop. Um, and it was super intense, and I probably didn't learn all that much because there was so much happening all at once. It was definitely not the level that I should have been at, but I just wanted to go somewhere and talk to people. Software is very expensive. Um, people who make pixel art are like, use Photoshop. Photoshop is expensive. Um, if your job gives it to you, that's great. Um, I'm not really into pirating software. Um, but who here hasn't pirated software before because a lot of it's very expensive. So not, and also, not all people have credit cards. Uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, services that are free, but in order to create an account, you have to enter a credit card. And there are a lot of people, at least in the United States, that don't have credit cards. So that's a huge barrier to get people to um, be able to use some sort of service or software. Um, another barrier for me was time. Time is very expensive. There are some people who have families, and then there are people like me who had like three jobs to sort of sustain my graduate school work, and I was living on my own. I didn't have a family to, to pay for me, and some people do, and that's like really great. Again, that's another form of privilege, but um, you have to think that not everyone has the time to like sit down and double down and read like a book about JavaScript and then move on from there. Timing is a huge issue. Um, and so, also, culture was another thing. The fact of the matter is, in this industry, you have to basically look a certain way. And looking at the audience, I'm sure you all are very nice, but a lot of you look a certain way, and that has gotten you pretty far, and a lot of other people have to work even harder and have to pretend in order to be acknowledged in some sort of way. When I worked in academia, I went by JJ in my email so that I would get responses, because when people saw Jen, that didn't take me seriously. And that's just literally an experience of mine that has happened and cannot be taken away from me. So I always think of that when I move on to other places. Um, and so tech culture today not only has issues of misogyny and you know all this other sort of stuff, is that um, we have these fake ideas that I, I love to talk about fake ideas. Um, Fake ideas are ideas that are not real, but we say them in order to project our insecurities onto other people. I have said these fake ideas. I used to be an educator. I used to teach these fake ideas. And I'm trying to bring awareness to them by talking about them and admitting that. Um, one of those fake ideas is that building for the web is easy. 
It's simple. You could just do it. Just throw together all this sort of package JSON files and throw in like all that other stuff, and then you're good to go. And npm install and walk away and get a coffee for a half hour and then come back and all this sort of stuff like that. That's a good fake idea. Um, I am self-taught. Um, I've told people I'm self-taught, but then when you say that you're self-taught, you sort of forget that there is someone who has helped you along the way, be it someone who's written a book that you read or someone who has guided you in some sort of way. Um, I went to a lot of college, so I definitely wasn't self-taught. Uh, everything is going great all of the time. Uh, coding has never made me cry ever. <laughs> These are all very fake ideas. And the problem with fake ideas, besides them being fake, we have to all be real to ourselves, is that they raise those barriers of entry into, web development in, into the web development industry. It raises them a little bit higher, because a lot of people are looking in. They're like, I'm interested in this field. And everybody's like, this is really great. This is so easy, sobbing at the same time. Like, it's not a space that anybody wants to enter. Uh, and especially if you're like a woman, like. We deal with enough stuff just existing in the world. Why would we want to compound that by entering an industry where there's even more stress and you have to work even harder to prove yourself? And this falls in line with the issue of inclusivity and diversity. Um, because when you have a lack of diversity, inclusivity on a team working on your product, there's a lack of products that work for everyone. Um, and there's also a lack of products that are actually created to solve problems we have. I mean, how often have you heard about a new startup and you're like, who's going to use that? And then it fails like six months later and you're all like, I could have told you that, that was going to happen. That's not a real problem that society has. A real problem society has, for example, is that there are a lot of cities even in the United States that don't have clean water. How can we, how can we use technology to give clean water to people all over the world. Like, it blows my mind that we're not using our resources for that. I'm not going to list startups that I'm thinking of in mind. But like, there's plenty of things out there that those aren't problems that we need to solve. They're more impressing issues. Um, and if we had more diversity in companies building products and coming up with these ideas and getting funding, then I feel like we would be solving a lot of actual problems faster. Um, and again, I think we need to bring awareness to these fake ideas and talk more about real ideas. Like, building for the web is kind of hard, <laughs> um, especially as we're moving things more from server to front end. And now we're trying to move things back to the server side as we realize that maybe building all of our apps in the front, on the client side is a little slow and not performant. Um, we don't learn it alone, as I mentioned before. Um, there's always somebody out there who's created some sort of tool to help us. Just like we are not born knowing how to code, there needs to be some sort of environment that nurtures that. And so we have to be aware of making sure that people who feel like they're alone shouldn't be alone and help those out. Um, our tools are far from perfect. I don't think anybody would disagree with me on that, um, which is why I think mo who here for like their main gig builds tools for developers? Yeah, I think like a lot of people do. and. and it's because they're far from perfect. And also, we're human. We have to think about those barriers. And software is for humans. Humans are using it in some sort of way. Um, and so we have to remember that when we're making decisions, both about who we're putting on our teams, who we're hiring, what we're building for, and so forth. So I think that um, we should think about barriers to entry when building and designing products, um, both hobby and professional. Um, because both your side projects and your professional work are important and probably and hopefully used by humans. And I don't think that, regardless of whether your side project makes money or not, I don't think that capitalism should be a factor in how we combat social problems in our work. Um, and so my hobby is make 8bitart.com, and my professional product, um, Fog Creek, with my team there, is glitch.com. And regardless of their differences and beginnings, there are a lot of parallels uh, in the product's missions. Uh, and I think that's why the team we get along so well, is we have the same idea of like solving problems uh, and thinking of others. Um, and that's because we have sort of shifted our focus from what we individually need to a bigger picture of what's best for all of us. Um, and that's basically anybody who wants to make stuff. Um, 
and that could be developers, non-developers. There are people who use code to solve problems who aren't developers, just like I fixed my toilet once, but I'm not a plumber. You know, so it's like a perspective to think of. Um, and we do that by sort of focusing on both um, tools and community, because I think those are the two pain points in the industry is that our tools aren't that great, and neither is our community. Tools, I think, are the easiest part. It's just software. Um, any level of developer, artist, like fresher experience, in a nutshell, um, wants to primarily do two things, and that's uh, the first thing is make something. Who here likes making things? Cool. That's like sort of, we want to try new things, make things. That's why we're all here. Um, so years ago, I wanted to make pixel art in the browser for free. I didn't want to pay for Photoshop. Um, it's just a lot of software to do like a small, very lo-fi thing. Uh, Photoshop otherwise is great. Um, so I made a pixel art editor in the browser for free. Well, I made it free. Uh, and that became Make 8-Bit Art, which was a lot uglier back then. Um, and that's basically it. I wanted to make something, and so I did. And it took a long time because I was kind of by myself. I used the internet and read a lot of blogs about CSS because I was new to CSS. Um, PHP developers typically don't do like styling. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and the hardest part for me wasn't making the software. It was figuring out the problem I needed to solve when I wanted to learn something. Um, and if that's hard for you too, finding out like a project to choose to learn something, I really highly recommend art. There's just so much creative stuff out there that you can re recreate using code. And it's a great sort of foundation for learning. With Glitch, we wanted to foster app building and learning like in the browser. And we also wanted to think of the socio socioeconomic diversity of like there are people who don't have credit cards that so do we want to like make people pay to use it and, and so forth. Um, and so the team built a, a web IDE. Uh, let me see if this is gonna start playing. Uh, no. So we built an IDE. Um, or code editor that works in the browser. You can build static apps or you can build full stack node apps. Um, and much like Make 8 Bit Art and myself, it's very cute looking. Uh, and it's also very powerful, much like myself. Uh, so the great thing about building code in the browser is that it's very portable. This is what's great about JavaScript. When I was teaching Java, you had to teach students how to set up a JVM, Java Virtual Machine. Uh, and then if they built something in the computer lab and then brought it home, it usually didn't work at home because they usually didn't have the JVM on their home machine. But with JavaScript, all you needed was a browser. This is like blowing my mind as an educator back then. And so then the idea when all these sort of code editors in the browser came out, it was like, oh, great. Now we don't even have to like, teach students how to install like JGrasp or Eclipse and stuff like that um, at home, this is just like a portable thing that they can do. And this is what's great about JS Fiddle and CodePen and Glitch and so forth. Um, we also, because we don't learn alone, uh, some of us pair program like I do with my cat Jeffrey there. Uh, it is a multi-user editor, so multiple people can go in at once and program together. Um, we support Node, but because you basically get a container or a VM, you can use kind of any language. We mostly focus on Node. And I really like how we use library.io to uh, search and add packages to your package JSON file. Or if you just type it, it will like add it in there. I think that's pretty fun. Um, and we really like people using APIs with Glitch, and it's really powerful for that. And we also use it, too, on our end. So like once you make something, you want to show something off. This is the great thing about making art with code is that a lot of people appreciate art. Not a lot of people might appreciate your NPM module that counts how many seconds have passed towards a certain point. Um, developers may appreciate it, but like my grandpa might not. And so art is a great way to enter that space. Um, but you also want to show it somehow. And with Make 8-Bit Art, we basically just use social media. Um, people email me all the time that they've like, there are people who've made games using Make 8-Bit Art. Um, there are kids who use it. I, I love, I was going through tweets for screenshots of this and I started to cry because I was like one super jet lagged. <laughs> and two, it was just very nice. 
And with Glitch, we also provide a way for people to showcase the apps that they're making that you can view the source. Remember viewing source? Who here has view learned viewing source of other people's websites? You can't really do that today because we obfuscate all of our code behind like JavaScript frameworks and build processes, and sometimes we'll put some sort of source map up there. But with Glitch, you can not only view the client side source, but you can also view the node source, which is pretty great. Uh, viewing source on the server side, that's new, 2017. Uh, and yesterday, we launched user profile pages. Like, maybe like right before we went to the speaker dinner last night, I was like on Slack. This is how I type. And uh, <laughs> so we launched user profile pages so you can show off um, your favorite projects that you've created and worked on. Um, lately, I've been working on a lot of starter apps for people to get into something. Um, like, if you wanted to get started with HTML, I have a starter HTML app. And you can sort of clone it and work on it. But the important part and bonus to all this is um, owning your work. I think owning your work is one of the most important things for me as an engineer and also as an artist. Um, with Glitch, when you, when you build a product in Glitch, if you build a product and make Art, you own it. Um, you're using the platform, but we're not sort of tying you to any certain philosophies on how to program. With Make 8-Bit Art, yeah, you have to dra draw pixel art. It's a pixel art editor. <laughs> but you can lower the pixel size to one and draw as if it were MS Paint. But at the end of the day, Make 8-Bit Art, you can save your images and you own them. I don't own anything. People email me asking if they can use it. I'm like, yes, go ahead and use it with Glitch. You can like export your projects as a zip file or export to GitHub, and it will work if you deploy it on basically any node server, and it just works, and that's great. Um, because I don't want people to use something that I'm making and then me have any ownership over it. Um, this is just, I think, whenever you're using a new tool on your team or for any of your side projects, you really need to make sure that like, what you're putting into it is all yours, and you can get it back in some sort of way. Uh, and, and ownership is overall like a big theme in the open source community. Who here is involved in open source in any way? Whether you consume it or you give back to the community. I think it's really important to ask yourself when you're building products, am I consuming open source? If I'm not, why not? And if I am, how am I giving back? Um, Make 8-Bit Art is, uh, is an open source project. Um, Anybody can go and make a PR or add an issue or feature requests and stuff like that. It's on GitHub. Um, I have about 12 contributors. And one of my things is that when you create a feature for Make 8-Bit Art and it gets merged, you become a committer. I just like give you commit access, and I trust you. And I feel like the more that we trust ourselves in these smaller projects, the best. And because of that, Make 8-Bit Art is a lot faster, especially the paint fill tool. There's a lot of math that goes into pixel art, whether you like it or not. Um, with Glitch, Glitch, the product itself is, is not open source, but we facilitate the creation of open source apps. Um, and Glitch.com, the, the, the website end, is itself an open source um, app. Um, if you're interested in listening to me from a few years ago, talk for about 45 minutes about my philosophies on open source, specifically um, how sometimes it's very lonely and, and aggro. Um, you can check out my talk from Thunder Plains JS. Um, I basically talked about how I built Make 8-Bit Art and develop it with the idea that most of my users are not developers. And so, for example, with Make 8-Bit Art, I commit my build files. I don't require you to download the project or clone the project and then run npm install, because some people are downloading it and they don't have Node on their computer. So if you want to check that out, it's called Your Grandpa May Not Have Node. And if so, all, if he does, all the power to him. Um, but the hardest part, tools are easy, is community. Um, so the community, the questions I get from them working as a community engineer in Glitch is like, what do I make? Like, I don't know what to do. Um, as I mentioned before, usually, like, I look towards art for inspiration. Um, and you can look towards, like, new things, and you, you might be like, oh, I want to try this cool new thing, but I don't know what I'm going to make with it. I hear this all the time. Um, with Make 8-Bit Art, um, I was learning software um, using art, and then I sort of, a few years later, flipped the switch and was like, I want to learn about art 
like using software. And so I created VART at VART.institute, um, which is a site where you can um, see me talk about fine art that I learned through studying it. And also, um, I've made little JavaScript apps that either build inspired generative uh, versions of fine art or art facilitating tools that allow you to create your own. And so that's like a thing that is now people, I, I see a lot of people doing now where they're taking artists like Joseph Albers and, and coding versions of his homage to the square. Like if you see a piece of art that you really like, think how can I digitize this? And it's a good small like time box way to learn some sort of web thing. And if you have an idea like, oh, I want to do something with React, like how can you incorporate React into an art app? Uh, with Glitch, we uh, want to be a source of inspiration um, for making anything in code. And so we showcase the things that you make on our site. Um, we have lots of categories like building blocks, hello worlds. Um, OAuth is like a thing that, who here loves to roll their own OAuth on every project? I don't want to see anyone raise their hands, no one. <laughs> so imagine going to glitch.com and going to building blocks and finding a bunch of OAuth apps implemented that you can then just remix and build on top of. No one has to do OAuth again. You're welcome. I love taking credit for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can like, Instead of writing a bot from scratch, you can see an existing bot, remix it, and then have it going on your own account in like a minute. Um, and glitch.com itself, as I mentioned, is an app. You can go down and view the source of it. Um, and you know, as soon as you um, remix a project or create a project, it auto deploys. Um, you don't have to worry about DevOps, which is a huge barrier to learning how to code, because you might have like your first index.html file, and then you're like, okay, how do I get this on the web? And when students ask that to me, I'm kind of like, oh, that's like a whole other like two semesters like of teaching. So Glitch takes that barrier down by auto deploying all your apps. If you remix an app, you get a new URL which you can change. It deploys as you edit it, which is pretty fun. Uh, and because we don't learn alone, we always want to think of a way that we can allow our users to get help. Um, when we were younger, when I was younger, I was always hesitant to raise my hand to ask for help, and I was also hesitant to raise my hand when I had the answer. So I'm always thinking, like, why isn't there a space online like, where we can do that? And the team has sort of created that with Glitch, where if you're having issues, you can sort of highlight your code snippet, and you can ask the community for help. Um, and it's asking for help and like helping is like a chicken and egg problem. People want to help, but they're not sure if they're like overstepping their boundaries. So we're trying to think of ways, and again, this is beta, we're trying to think of ways to facilitate that sort of relationship. Um, and if you're more advanced and you want to help, we built it on glitch.com where you can see people who have asked for help. Uh, and if you go to their editor, they'll say, like, oh, I've asked for help at this certain point. Uh, and then they can let you in. Uh, and if they help you out, because again, it's a multi-user editor, they can uh, remove you the project or thank you. Um, every project has a .env file that you can put your secrets in. And if someone goes into the project to help you, they still don't see your secrets, so it's still secure. And if someone remixes your project that has secrets, they don't get those secrets. Uh, and if they help you and they thank you, you, the person who helped them, see little hearts over your icon, which I think is really cute. Um, I think that feeling good and like getting positive reinforcement uh, is really important in our industry, especially with all of the negative feedback the internet tends to give us. And so if you're building a tool where feedback can be part of that, you should build that into it. Just like the ability to thank someone or be like, great job is, is really cool. GitHub sort of added this um, maybe like a year or so ago where it was beyond like just doing thumbs up. You can add the celebration emoji and stuff like that. But we can take it even further because it's just, it's nice to be thanked once in a while, I think. Um, and I feel like these cute celebrations are great for people of all ages and levels of dev experience. I mean, who here, regardless of your age, likes fun celebrations? Yeah. 
If we're going to sit in front of a computer all day, we might as well be looking at something fun and happy, even if the code itself is not necessarily fun and happy. Um, because having fun, I think, is a major bonus for uh, being a developer if you can get it done. Um, so uh, with Make 8-Bit Art, um, I showed, I had a kiosk at the Game On 2.0 exhibit in Toronto. This was my first art show I was in. Uh, and there were kids that were using it and making their avatars, and they were smiling, and again, oh, I'm going to cry. It's so fun. And, and because Make 8-Bit Art is open source, people can take that source. Um, Simple had a hackathon, and one of their developers I think she was a support person, and now she's an engineer, uh, incorporated Make 8-Bit Art into their support software. They couldn't have done that if Make 8-Bit Art wasn't open source, because they couldn't build it in like a day. Um, so that's super fun and cool. Um, they have the lyrics to Shaggy's Angel up there, in case you're a Shaggy fan. Uh, uh, and also, like, Make 8-Bit Art's source code has dinosaur ASCII art in it, which is pretty rad. Um, and there have been a lot of parents who said that their kids have gotten excited about it because they're like, oh, you can do that in code. You can put drawings and stuff like that. Um, I feel the same way. Uh, and because we tell people that Glitch is the place to build after their dreams, we see a lot of fun stuff. It turns out a lot of people have really great dreams. Um, you can have fun while uh, working on cutting edge web technology. Uh, this is an A-frame project. Tomorrow there's going to be a talk about A-frame, so stick around. Um, and this is a Glitch app. And A-frame, uh, their education material is they use Glitch as sort of a platform because Again, all the features that we have right now are free, and those features will remain free. Um, so it's really great for education and just building really awesome VR experiences. Could you imagine five years ago if there was VR in the browser? That's why when we talk about performant client-side apps, it's like, if we can do this in the browser, we really should be able to do anything. Uh -oh. And if your project's not private, you can allow people to remix them, which leads to a lot of fun. Uh, one of my favorite projects, uh, Glitch Projects is by this guy, Dan Reeves. He made this thing called Facemoji, where it's using cutting edge uh, Chrome browser technology. Uh, I, think, I think it was Chrome, yeah. Chrome Canary technology to uh, detect your face and add emoji pieces to it. Um, and I fell in love, and I knew, being me, that I can make this even creepier, so I remixed it and added my own face pieces to it. Um, and then here's Dan with my face pieces on him. Uh, and it was as soon as I remixed his project, and it auto-deployed, so people were able to use it, and then I just had to add my assets to it. So it took me about two minutes. Um, and then my friend Ben made it even creepier <laughs> by remixing it and adding the mouse for eyes. So, um, so yeah, the the. The features in like make eight, bar, eight, make 8 bit art in Glitch and the things that I work on on the side as well, I try to think of making them low cost or having some sort of free features. Again, thinking about socioeconomic diversity, um, make them portable, time saving, and community focused, um, which makes a much nicer looking t shirt, I think, uh, especially in that color. I might buy it. Um, so I want you to t go away today. Just remembering that, that software is made for humans. Um, we can use code to build tools, but we have to focus on the community, because that's the hardest part. Um, because we want to lower barriers to get more people into the industry and to stay in the industry, because we're ultimately going to build better products and have more users um, that way. You want your users to be diverse, so you want the people who are building those projects to be diverse and reflect our user base. It just seems like a non-issue to me, but it happens to be one. Um, and we want to make making things easier, but we can't do it alone. We all have to work together. We all have to have conversations about these things, uh, conversations with people that don't look like us. Um, I also want. I also think that Make Ape Art is a great case study for open source in a world of both developers and non-developers. Um, and it wouldn't exist without my contributors and my users who simply want to like try new things and use future things to do that. Uh, for Glitch, if you work at a company that has an open API and you want people to use it, get in touch with us because we want to help um, you inspire and get people to try your new things. Um, so in conclusion, uh, problems exist. We should talk about them unapologetically. It's very hard to get on stage in front of 550 people in a foreign country. If I can do it, any of you can. <laughs> 
Um, we could use code to solve those problems, as we should. It's most of our jobs to do that. Um, and use your voice to solve those problems as well by having those conversations. Um, aim to inspire. Um, we want to get others to try new things, and obviously it's hard for a lot of people to do, even though the phrase, try new things, sounds like an easy thing to do. Um, it's hard work. Um, you could be met with harassment, loss of work, and a lot of stress, take my word for it. Um, but it's really important to work hard. Um, I think that taking the path of most resistance makes that path easier for the people that are behind us. Uh, and so there's two kinds of people in this industry, those who take that path of most resistance and those who pull up the ladder behind them. Don't be the one who pulls the ladder up behind them. It's not cool. Uh, again, have fun, because I think fun is inclusive. Most of us want to have fun. Make art, build the app of your dreams, and enjoy the rest of Full Stack Fest. Thank you. Come back out here for some Q&A. Uh, I know. I was like, oh, I think I took too much time. Um, that was really fantastic and inspiring. Um, and I have a few questions from the audience here. We cool. have a few minutes. So thank you for talking about the importance of building technology around the idea of access and removing barriers to entry. It's clear that the tools that you build are centered around that idea. Um, what are some more ways that you would want to make Glitch or 8-Bit Art even more accessible? Um, I think, well, one thing that, we're, that I'm working on with both Make 8-Bit Art, which is in my free time, which there's very little of, um, and with Glitch, is actual accessibility. Mm. Um, when we launched user profiles, we did an accessibility audit of the community site, glitch.com, and we found things like, oh, when we had a modal window pop up, it didn't focus, and so how is someone supposed to tab through that? someone who normally doesn't use your keyboard to browse might not like notice that, and so we're like, we have to make sure that at the very least it's keyboard accessible, screen reader accessible. Um, turns out it's not that hard to do. You just have to like make a task for it, made a Trello card for it, like accessibility audit, and then update it. And now we, we're, we're at a task with doing that with the editor, which is a bigger ordeal. Um, we use Code Mirror as like the code editor part, uh, and so that has its own accessibility issues. Fortunately, it's an open source project, so any work that we do on that, we can sort of upstream to them. Um, the WordPress core community is using Code Mirror on, I think, Gutenberg, and so they're also interested in what we're doing, because we're all kind of like, we need to make this all accessible for our users. So that's just always constantly thinking of how we can improve that. That's awesome. Um, how are you planning to monetize Glitch? Ah, so, my, and this is my own philosophy, but I think it matches the team. Um, we can, first of all, the, the features that we have glitched right now are free, and those features will remain free. We have constraints that we publicize on the site, like you have a 128 megabyte disk space limit. We might in the future have an off-ramp premium feature where you can expand that space, but we're not going to lower that space from you. Again, anything that's on the site right now is free. We don't want to screw that up. Um, we are working with, um, we have glitch.com slash for platforms. We're working with big companies who want to use Glitch in order to get their example apps and documentation out to you. Uh, and so we want like companies to sort of pay to support Glitch to support their documentation. So if you have documentation that involves code, you should be using Glitch. Um, because one, it's full stack, so you can do like API documentation with ease and embed it. Um, and if you want analytics and stuff like that, and you want to know what people are making with your with your project, like I think that's super powerful. So that's what we're thinking of in terms of, of money. Nice, that's awesome. And then last question, you mentioned some general advice for how people can lower barriers to entry within their projects. So you said free, portable, community oriented. Are there some specific like low hanging fruit? things that like, people can do on their apps almost immediately? I think the problem I see right now um, is the whole trend of uh, payment plans and requiring that credit card to use your service, even if it's free. Mm -hmm. AWS does this. Mm -hmm. uh, and when people want to get their site online, then usually the next step is like, OK, let me set you up with hosting. You can use AWS for free for a year or something like that, but you have to enter a credit card. And I was in a space where I was teaching, and I did that. And the student, uh, they were like, I, I don't have a credit card. I don't have any money. And it was incredibly, it was, it was I'm, I'm getting like emotional thinking about it now. Like it's like, it's, 
you don't want to put anybody into an embarrassing situation where you're showing them like, look, you don't belong here. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There are people who think like, oh, if you don't have five dollars to like host a website, then you don't belong here. Mm -hmm. And it's like they're just trying to enter the industry and make as much money as we do. Like, let's give them that. Mm -hmm. So I think that the the um, the socioeconomic diversity issue is a big problem that a lot of us. It's easy for us to forget because a lot of us are making really good money. Um, so thinking of that. Uh, other than that, I mean, again, I really think that the, if you can get your team's diversity to reflect what your user base wants to be, if you're not sure what your team diversity should be, look at your user base mm -hmm. and see who's using it, you know? Yeah, it's so true. So true, yeah. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you. Another round of applause, please.